So this is module four, titled Attributes and Rules. So we're right in the middle, in the sweet spot of what people do when they're working in Oracle policy modeling. They work with attributes in order to build rules. The word rule, of course, is synonymous with business rules, government policy, the advice that you're trying to give. Advice is not always good news, but at least with Oracle Intelligent Advisor, you're going to be able to formalize it and be sure you're giving the right advice to your consumers. In the previous demo, for the first time, we addressed the idea of an attribute. An attribute is a discrete piece of information that you've written in a Word document or that has been interpreted from what you wrote in a Word document. If you come from the world of customer relationship management, ERP, or indeed any other enterprise software, you're probably familiar with different terminology. You maybe talk about a field, you know, this field is required, or this column in this database table is, is, is 15 characters long. You can think of an attribute as something not dissimilar to those ideas. The uniqueness of Oracle Intelligent Advisor means that an attribute in our world typically is made up of natural language text, like the pilot is authorized to fly the plane. Whereas in other applications, you might have much shorter names or much more technical names. So an attribute in, o in Oracle Intelligent Advisor has natural language text. It has also other features that we'll talk about in the demo. The second bullet point reminds us that we should be writing coherent sentences. If you come from another programming language, it can be very tempting to be as concise and as terse as possible. This does not apply for Oracle Intelligent Advisor. You're using Microsoft Word or Excel and you're writing natural language. If you're concerned or you have a thought about, well, if I make it longer, will it be slower? Because when you're a programmer, you spend your time trying to make things as small and short as possible. That's not how this works, okay? So building a legible and easy to read piece of text is far more important here. Technically, what happens under the skin is not what we're gonna focus on right now. So writing longer, more obvious, easy to read sentences is the key thing here. So I've made a little list of gotchas. When you start writing sentences like the, let's not call them pilots anymore, let's imagine that they're would-be pilots. The, the candidate or the candidate pilot is authorized to fly the plane. There's a verb in there, is authorized, well is really, to be. As soon as you start writing phrases like that with a verb in them, then Oracle Intelligent Advisor will make a very important decision. It'll say, well, if you could say the, pilot, the candidate is authorized to fly the plane, then you can also say the candidate is not authorized to fly the plane. It immediately infers that the opposite is possible, which, if I can summarize, it realizes that what you're saying is a yes-no concept. It says, yeah, yes or no. The pilot can or cannot. Think about the other elements of my text from the previous demo. The candidate has met the health criteria, again, you either meet them or you don't. It's another Boolean, it's another binary, it's another yes, no. Typically speaking, if it doesn't have a verb, such as the amount to pay the customer, then it probably isn't a yes, no. The amount, the clue is in the text, I suppose, and that's another reason why you write clear text, so that both you and Oracle Intelligent Advisor will realize that, okay, this is not a binary thing, this is an amount of money or a number. Attributes are parsed. The engine of Oracle Intelligent Advisor, when you click validate, it extracted what you'd written in Word, and it said, okay, I found three things, but then it experimented and said, well, I can say this in the negative, I can say this in the positive, I can say this in the interrogative, and I can also say that I'm not sure. It pre-populates these phrases because we're gonna need them later on. What I'm trying to tell you is, 
If you write it as a positive sentence, like the pilot is authorized, you don't then have to go back and rewrite it in the negative or in the interrogative because that's going to happen automatically. Fourth one, and this is an important point, is we haven't got the entire Webster's or Merriam or Larousse dictionary. We have a subset of verbs. So later on in this course, we might find that a verb that we use in a particular industry isn't immediately recognized. So we will need to add it to the verb list. And then from that moment onwards, your project will understand what you mean. The last point is probably the most sensitive one is not all verbs are suitable for intelligent advisor. And that's a, you could say a subjective thing, but stay away from emotive words, stay away from things that aren't clearly or obviously negatable. If you say you must bring your passport, Oracle Intelligent Advisor will say, okay, well, the opposite must be true. You must not bring your passport. The two could be possible. But actually, that doesn't make any sense because what's the opposite of you must bring your passport is you don't need to bring your passport. So by avoiding certain words, by avoiding certain kinds of verb, we can avoid misunderstandings. Anyway, a little bit of an animation here to hopefully build, build this out. Here is a very simple structure, which I've sort of simulated. It should look vaguely familiar to the example, compared to the example we saw earlier on. Can you fly this plane? Are the health criteria satisfied? And are the competency criteria satisfied? So those, those two little guys there. And then we break it down into, well, the health criteria. You need to be aged over 18, and you need to have good vision, 2020 in this case. For the competency is, have you got a license? Because I know that pilots need a license. And you have to have regular checks to make sure that you still remember how to fly it. And it's all very well saying you have a license. But if I say, yeah, I've got a license to use a four-wheel lawnmower, it's no good if I want to fly a plane. So is it the right kind of license? And more importantly, I suppose, is, is the license currently valid? So this is a sort of extended version of what you saw in the previous chapter. So we're going to write this in Word. And I want you to notice a couple of things on the left-hand side. I've called this a pyramid. And there's a reason for that. It's because it really is like a tree structure. This will help later on when we start talking about how OPA or how Oracle Intelligent Advisor actually reads your text. We can write this in Word and Excel. We're going to use Word to begin with in as many documents as we wish. We could write this in one single paragraph, or we could write it in four different documents. It's our choice, whatever makes sense for our colleagues and our way of working. So here's the big question. If I was to categorize this as an interview, and the goal was to find out whether you can fly, fly the plane, is that the only goal hiding away here? Is there anything else in here that we could describe as a goal? I actually think there are. So I'm going to go ahead and click this now. So we've probably all identified that can you fly the plane is a goal. But it's not the only goal in here, in fact. You could classify the health criteria now almost as like a sub-goal or a sub-conclusion. Then you could say, well, these things underneath, they're not really goals at all, but they feed into that goal. They're attributes that help me decide whether I am actually going to say, yes, you pass the health criteria or not. Likewise, competency criteria are the same deal. It's a sub-goal. It's, it's, it's a, it's a sub-conclusion. And you probably now have worked this out is that the license could equally be said to be, I can summarize it like this. This is not really one pyramid. It's several nested pyramids, several nested trees, all living together in a structure, all living together in Word documents. So if there's one thing you take away from this slide is when you're building a project, you need to be focused on the goals. What are the goals of this project? What are the things that I want Intelligent Advisor to think about and assess for me? If you come from another programming language or from other so technical things like JavaScript and so forth, you'll be looking for things like procedures, line numbers, loops. You'll be looking to find out the 
order that things are executed in. That's not really how Oracle Intelligence Advisor works. Oracle Intelligence Advisor is actually focusing on goals. For every goal that it finds, it goes through a little circuit, which you can see here is basically for any goal, oops, excuse me, for any goal, am I able to answer the question yet? So if you can imagine starting the interview, the answer will probably be, well, no, because we haven't actually engaged with the consumer, the would-be pilot. Find the next question related to ask. So if this is the goal, maybe I need to start looking at these areas or these areas or these areas to find what's the best question to ask. Oracle Intelligence Advisor will be looking for the shortest possible way to reach the goal of knowing whether I can fly the plane or not. So it's going to ask me a question and I'll say, yeah, I have 20-20 vision, for example. Is that enough for Intelligence Advisor to make the decision about whether I can fly the plane or not? If the answer is yes, good. But if the answer is no, go around again. What's the next question I should ask? And the next question, and then we'll reach a point, hopefully, where we go, yes, we have everything we need to be able to make a decision and give you the advice, boom, you can or you cannot fly the plane. This cycle is at the heart of how Oracle Intelligence Advisor works. And it'll be quite a struggle for some people coming from linear and procedural languages to adapt to this. This is a reference slide and you can use it later on if you want and you can download the slides at the end of the module for some mapping of vocabulary. If you come from a traditional CRM, ERP or other uh, database related technologies. So I've tried to give you some keywords. Some of them we've already spoken about, a goal, an attribute, interview and so on. Some of them we will populate in the upcoming chapters. So that's why I'm saying it's a, it's a, um, it's a reference slide right now. You don't need to um, pay too much attention to all of them right now. So we're going to go into a short demo. This short demo is going to pick up where we left off with a slightly cleaned up and tidied up version of our pilot candidate issue. And we're going to take a little bit of a deep dive into attributes, structure and types. So I'm back in my project again. So I'm going to go back into my project again. So I'm going to go back into the project again and you'll notice three things. One, I still have my one word document. And when I double click my word document, you'll recognize, I hope the rule that I created in the previous demo, slightly corrected to include the word candidate instead of the pilot, because let's face it, I don't know if you're going to be the pilot yet. So frankly, uh, I don't want to make that decision. And it has the same formatting that we discussed earlier on. Um, if you are always wondering about, did I remember to format or not? What you can do is you can click the show styles button. The show styles buttons will remind you of the formatting you've applied. So in this case, I can see that I have correctly applied a conclusion and I've applied level one. If you're struggling with the concept of level one right now, think of it as this is what are the, what is the first level of logic that lets intelligent advisor decide whether this conclusion applies. So the first level of logic is, do you satisfy both of these criteria? You'll notice that I've used the word and to make sure that both these criteria are used. So I'm going to minimize that for a second and I'm going to go back to the data tab. You'll notice that I've got a bunch of data here that wasn't in the word document. So how did that work? My advice to you is this. As a general rule, when you're experimenting, you can always write directly in Word. But one of my favorite features is the ability to first describe the concept and then write about it in Word. For example, I could create an attribute now called the candidate's home base, because pilots have a home base. I need to choose what kind of information it is. This isn't a yes, no. This maybe is the name of a city or an airport code, or maybe it's a department number 
or maybe it's something else. I'm going to say it's just a piece of text. And I'm going to click OK. So I've created the attribute before I used it in Microsoft Word. Why did I do that? Because doing that allows me to take advantage of a very, very interesting feature in Microsoft Word. So I'm going to come back into Microsoft Word. I'm going to give myself some space. You'll notice here that I use the blank line button to give myself a blank line or two. And I'm going to say something like this, the candidate. But I'm going to stop right there because you know what? You've probably seen this at least three times already. It's quite hard not to make spelling mistakes when you're typing even things that you know pretty well again and again and again. And um, so what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to take it the other way around. I'm going to, first of all, click the conclusion format, telling Word that this is going to be a conclusion, but I haven't written it yet. Because the payoff is I'm able to use a feature called the rule assistant. Okay? So I'm going to go ahead now and say the candidate satisfies. And you're thinking, yeah, this is going to take him a long while. If I open up the rule assistant, a small window appears at the top of the screen. And if I go back and correct my spelling, I am seeing on screen proposals as to what it thinks I'm going to type based on attributes that I already have. And frankly, this is a wonderful way to gain time and avoid making spelling mistakes. Just double click the thing you want. I'm going to say if. Notice the second payoff too. I didn't have to format that second line as yellow because it knew that was coming next. And let's say something like the candidate's vision score is greater than or equal to 20. You'll remember that I talked about 2020 vision. So, in this particular instance, the candidate's vision score exists already as an attribute. I'm going to press the return, there we go. And I'm going to validate. And you probably noticed that I've used the same text, I'll get that here, as I did here. This is a very simple way of linking paragraphs together. Basically, I've said the health criteria. They're down here. Finally, let's switch back to the data tab and just review something related to that. You'll notice now that the role of the health criteria has changed. It's understood that the health criteria is not a goal, but it's not just basic input data either. It's somewhere in the middle because it's now part of our pyramid. So expect to see the roles change as you write the text. Finally, if you've made changes to your project and you're happy with what you've done, you should always be thinking, I should upload my work to the hub. So you'll notice that when I click upload, I'm going to type out something like this. Let's say added health criteria. And down here is a list of things that have changed since I last saved. It says, well, you added this and you made an update to this. I'm going to click Upload and it's gone. Again, we'll talk in much more detail about this whole administrative process later on. But what's that mean? It means right now that if I go to my application, you'll see that I have saved a copy of my work on the server, on my hub application. And you'll notice that I have two versions, the version from the previous chapter and the version from now. So that concludes our walkthrough of attributes and rules.